You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Welcome back to Modern Musicology. My name is Alan, and we've got a very special show coming up for you. This is the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the release of the very first Kiss album. It came out on February 18th. And to help me talk about this great subject, I've got a very special guest, Matt Alshbach from the Rock and Metal Profs podcast. Matt, how are you today? I'm great, Alan. Thanks for having me on the show, man. It is an honor to be back a second time on Modern Musicology. I I love the show and I love listening to you folks uh, as you talk about all things music and you really do talk about all things music. It's one of the most eclectic music podcasts (laughs) out there. I'm sure people that listen know that, but uh, I'm super excited to be talking about KISS today. You're part of a very small class of second timers on our show, which includes Gina Shock of the Go-Go's. So you're in very good company. Yes, indeed. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So as I mentioned, 50th anniversary of Kiss's big emergence onto the music scene, which, you know, February 18th was a momentous day for Kiss, but I don't know that the rest of the world really noticed it that much, at least not at first. But that first album, man, that is just loaded with Kiss classics. Strutter, Firehouse, Cold Gin, Deuce, 100,000 Years, Black Diamond, and some other songs. What's your impression of that first album? What do you think it is that sets that album apart from all the other Kiss records? Alan, this is the album that set me on the course of loving rock and heavy metal. So as a, oh, well. I was probably eight years old and, you know, I have this typical story about being in my uncle's room and he's got these records and I'm thumbing through them and I come across this cover, which I'm holding yeah. out for people that are listening. And it was just such a game changer. I, what is that? You know, I had to listen. He gave me the album, let me take it home. And I played it on my little kid's box record player. And I must have played this record a thousand times. It is uh, just loaded with classics. Um, my my colleague on the Rock and Metal Profs, Court Lewis, has often said that if this is the only album Kiss had ever put out, it would it would be considered one of the great classic rock albums. I agree with that assessment. But it, as you say, it's loaded with classics. Um, even the the track that they added later on, Kiss in Time, which a lot of people don't like, I actually like it. I think it's a great song. KISS fans probably know the story behind that. Um, Neil Bogart, the, the producer for the band, came to them and said, I want, I want you to do a single for this kissing contest at a radio station. <laughs> the band didn't want to do it, but they felt forced, so they kind of rewrote the lyrics very quickly over an afternoon and recorded it. And the thing was, it was never supposed to appear on an album. It was supposed to be a one-off single, and before mm-hmm. long, it is on the debut album. I actually think it's a great song. There's not a bad song on the album, and yeah. you know, as they say, they had had their entire life to write this album, so it's <laughs> not surprising that it is very, very good. Yeah, and a lot of these songs are holdovers from their previous band, Wicked Lester. So these songs had been sort of percolating for a while, and they had been sitting with them, so I feel like they are really solid they're really perfected by the time they get to recording this first album absolutely have you heard the album from wicked lester Mm, parts of it i have heard you know like some of the like the early version of she which doesn't show up until kiss's third album you know and a few others like that Right. It's very yeah. different. <laughs> it, it, it is very different. It's really an amalgam of different styles and influences of the time. And it, so it's got some really interesting, I guess what I'd call mashups by today's terminology, where mm. it's a rock song and then suddenly there's harps and flutes. It's, right. it's very strange. <laughs> it's very strange. But there are some, like Black Diamond is fully intact. It's exactly like it appears on the studio album. It's really interesting to see that that evolution that was taking place. Yeah. For folks that have not heard Wicked Lester, you can find it on YouTube. It's really interesting. 
It really is. It's an it's a fascinating listen to see the way that Gene and Paul are involved in this band and the way that they transform these things into what becomes the signature Kiss sound is really, really interesting. It's interesting that you asked me to do this show because I just finished reading both Paul and Gene's autobiographies. And so oh, I'm nice. well I'm well versed at this moment in in the early history of the band and what they were attempting to do. And, you know, Wicked Lester, they've said, just was they hadn't found their musical style. They didn't know who they were as a band. And when they finally left Wicked Lester, um, they knew they wanted to be a gritty hard rock band, but they also knew that they wanted to have some flair and flamboyance and they wanted to do something that no one had seen before. Paul's talked about that many times. And thank God that they did because <laughs> Wicked Lester is a far cry from this first Kiss album. But, yeah. So where do you think Wicked Lester might have gone had it continued on and Gene and Paul not left to form Kiss? I think it would have taken a similar trajectory. I don't know if the way they would have had the makeup, but I think the yeah. music probably would have gone in that direction with Gene and Paul being the primary songwriters and singers. Yeah. I mean, probably I think so too. That direction. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of uh, Peter's makeup on the album? Oh, well, now. I actually really like it, but yeah. you know, talking about the, the interesting story behind kissing time, this has an equally interesting story where the band did their own makeup, except for Peter who had yeah. a makeup artist do yeah. it for him. And I guess the makeup artist did his or her own interpretation of what the cat man should be. It's very interesting. I kind of like it. I do too. Especially if you take a look at, you know, when Peter was doing his own makeup, particularly during that last tour after he'd come back to the band, the, it had gotten really sloppy, the makeup. The <laughs> eyes were very, very large. Yeah. It was quite strange what he was doing. He wasn't, he wasn't being quite as meticulous as you might want as a Kiss fan with the makeup. So I really like this incarnation of the makeup. And I'm sure you've seen that, you know, in the early incarnations of the band, uh, Paul was wearing, it looked, he looked like a bandit with yeah. two things covering the eyes. And I think that would have been really interesting if he'd gone that direction as well. I agree. I like the fact that he ended up with the, the single star because it sets his makeup apart from all the other ones. And it's not that same, like mirrored pattern on both sides of the face, you know, right. but I think the, the bandit makeup is really neat. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Is, has there ever been a greater marketing decision than the, the artwork on this first album for, yeah. especially for like young boys, teenagers, the, the album sells itself just on the imagery. Yeah, totally. It really does. And you know, I've, I've heard the story that Warner brothers was the distributor for Casablanca records and they did a, like a big press release with Kiss playing and Warner Brothers hated it. And they're like, if the band doesn't take the makeup off, then we're gonna drop Casablanca from our roster. And the band refused, the album came out and true to their word, Warner Brothers dropped Casablanca. So Casablanca was pretty much on their own after that. Right, yeah, yeah. The early history of the band is is fraught with perils and difficulties, no no question. <laughs> and those first three albums don't sell particularly well. No, no. It's it's it, and I found that hard to believe because as a Kiss fan, m me and all of my friends, we were trying we were just any t of these we could get, right? We were trying <laughs> to buy all of these albums. Do you remember the album The Originals? Oh Alex? yes. Oh, yeah. That was that was my introduction to um, Hotter Than Hell and Dress to Kill. Is yes. I bought that three. I think I paid seven ninety nine in the store. And of course, it's worth a few hundred dollars today, and I don't own it anymore. <laughs> damn it! Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, we were just trying to find those albums, so I find it hard to believe that they didn't do well commercially until, of course, Alive. Right. Right. My first record was record of any kind was Love Gun, which I got for my 13th birthday. And cool. so from there, I started to get the back catalog. And so the originals was my first exposure to the first three albums. Yeah, it was later on that I got individual, you know, packagings of those first three, but the originals and I did not have a first pressing mine was a second pressing so it would not be worth hundreds now it's only worth like maybe 10 or 12 bucks but you know well you it's, they're so hard to find though alan i mean even I if you find a second press they're really difficult to find and they had all kinds of goodies in them i don't know if you remember but they had cards 
there were posters, there were a lot of, uh, Kiss was really great about throwing in some extras for, yeah. for fans. And that was, that was smart. There was a booklet. Yeah. The, the temporary tattoos. Yeah. Um, in the love gun album, it had the, the punch out love gun thing that you could fold up and, you know, <laughs> yeah, you could fire it once before it broke. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> oh man! So going back to that first album, what do you think are some of the standout tracks? What's like your your go to tracks on that album? I think Black Diamond is probably the best song Kiss has ever written. I know that's controversial, but it's, wow. it's, it's just a, a complete song. I love how it, it starts out slow. It's got the acoustic piece uh, and then gets a little heavier, gets grittier. That's great. I love hundred thousand years. That baseline to start hundred thousand years is so great. You see these bands that in their early years, they're getting along, they're excited, they're hungry, they're poor, yeah they're trying to dig their way out of the slums and that was definitely the case with all four of these guys they came from very humble beginnings and so you know they had everything to gain by making this work they they practiced exhaustively in the loft uh to really tighten these songs up and as as we've already said they had a long time to craft these songs they they came with some existing material but you know it was a uh, lightning in a bottle it really was mm -hmm. Ace Fraley, you know, although he, we know he was a drinker at this point, he wasn't, you know, he hadn't gotten to the, the, the penguin ace that we know today, wah, wah, you know, that <laughs> wasn't there yet. you know, he was obviously barely, you know, had, had his cognitive abilities intact. He was, yeah. I understand he was always lazy in reading this book. Paul and Gene make a point of saying that Ace Fraley would never carry his own gear. They had to do it for him. He was always lazy. That I know doesn't sound that lazy. That sounds diva. Yeah, I think it's probably a combination <laughs> of both, but he refused to work. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, for this first several albums, he was a, really a great musician. He was flourishing. I think he, he, there was a lot of room for growth. Mm -hmm. But as a lot of KISS fans have noticed, he never really progresses out of that. He's really playing the same type of music by the time we get to Love Gun. He's, yeah. he's, not, cha he's not improved as a soloist, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think there's a lot of innovation on those first three albums. There's okay. a lot of, I mean, musically and him individually as a guitar player, I think there's a lot of really interesting things going on. And there still is on the second set of three albums, you know, but maybe, I don't know, maybe he kind of felt, I think maybe Destroyer was a big thing, a big turning point for him, because I don't think that he really was as comfortable with the setting that uh, Destroyer was made in, you know, the orchestra and the choir and all that stuff. Yeah, he said that he just wants to make straightforward rock and roll albums, and yeah. he did that. He he was definitely um, kind of innovative and, and revolutionary with those early albums. I remember listening to those albums as a kid and thinking, this guy's an incredible guitar player. Well, I now know as an adult and a guitar as a guitar player that he was basically playing your 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 pentatonic scale just in different combinations around the board. It wasn't mm -hmm. anything, you know. He, he was he was really proficient at doing that, but he wasn't you know, kind of stepping outside of his comfort zone, trying new things. I think the only time you even get an example of him kind of stretching himself a little bit is, believe it or not, on music from The Elder, which I don't yeah. know if we'll talk about that or not. But you see, even though he only plays on a couple of songs, he's being challenged by Bob Ezrin on on, on music from The Elder to do something different. And he does, mm -hmm. particularly with the song Dark Light. Um, Man, yeah, definitely. What a great guitar solo that is in that it's song. Killer. It's killer. Yeah. And you don't expect when you start playing that album, you don't expect you're going to find some of Ace's best guitar work on that album. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't mean to red herring us by going to music <laughs> from the Elder. Oh well, because that's, okay. that's a controversial album, right? But he that song "Dark Light" is so that when you hear him play guitar on it, you're like, "Wow, what was going on there?" That he played this extended, really ripping solo, and we now yeah. know it was because Bob Ezrin was pushing him hard. Yeah. to do something and to play it properly, which is, you know, antithetical to Ace's style, which is a little relaxed and even a little, a little, you know, he kind of meanders a bit when he plays his solos. They're never quite <laughs> the same each time he plays them, which yeah. is, you know, that's not uncommon. Jimmy Page does the same thing. That's true. There's yeah. so many similarities between those two. And there was such a rivalry. I mean, I remember in high school, 
the big rivalry, at least amongst the student body that I was a part of, between Paige and Fraley. Who was the better one? Who was the more proficient player? Which band that they were in was the better band? And you know, it was like they were the only two guys on the on the field at that point. Well, that is definitely Led Zeppelin in terms of ability and <laughs> creativity. Like I, I, you know, we had that same conversation, but it usually didn't go very far because I think most people acknowledge that you know Jimmy Page was this musical genius, particularly his writing and composing. Um, yeah, but you know, Ace, he just had a certain a certain flair, right? Yeah. He had a certain, there's a certain grit and swagger to the way that he plays guitar that is really unique. And I think that's why even today, so many people love him and think he's one of the greatest guitar players ever. I can't argue with it. Swagger was exactly the word that I was thinking of as you were saying that. There's just something really, really interesting about his playing. He's a unique player. And I think we see that a lot with self-taught musicians, right? They've created mm -hmm. their own style and you definitely see that. But uh, yeah, there are so many tracks. As I said, I don't think there's a bad track on the album. What do you think? Do you think there's anything that any material that's weaker than others? Well, uh, you know, love theme from Kiss. It's, it's an interesting experiment. It's a, it's a nice little instrumental. I'm not sure that I'm as hip to it as the rest of the album. You know, so that's it's an obvious weak one, but you know it's 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 an okay song still. I think that particularly Ace does better instrumentals later on in his career, but um, yeah, I mean, I think everything on this album is a standout. You know, I mean, you can't argue with Cold Gin, you can't argue yeah. with Hundred Thousand Years, you know, and Strutter is just one of the most fun songs they ever did. Yeah, Strutter, Firehouse, fantastic. What a run of songs on that album. Yeah, I'm telling you. And so many of them still in the live set, right? You know, they were still playing four or five on the live set at the on the end of the road tour. Yeah, and that tells you everything you need to know about this first album is that it is the well that they continuously go back to. Everything they do revolves around this set of songs. And there's at least five of them that have continued in Kiss sets for 50 years. It's crazy. Yeah, that and Destroyer. Those are the two albums they pull yeah. heavily from in the live set. Yeah. All right. So those first three albums, as you mentioned, didn't really sell that well. And it isn't until Alive. And that's really sort of my origin as a Kiss fan is that I was... You know, I'm a bit older than you, so I was kind of growing up musically in the 70s, and I started listening to radio and sort of forming my own musical identity around 73, 74. So I was right there when the live version of Rock and Roll All Night was released as a single and became a hit. So that was my real first exposure to Kiss. And it's interesting to look at a live and compare those versions of the songs to the recorded versions on those first three albums. And I think that it's night and day. Yeah, a lot of people have said that. I, you know, my trajectory is slightly different in that I had all of the studio albums. I actually did not own a live one or two as a kid. Didn't have either one of nice. those. But I heard them often. And like you... I, I, I had this distinct memory of being in a like an ice cream shop at 10 years old and rock and roll all night the alive version was on this jukebox you could select it and that was astonishing to me as a kid because kiss didn't get any airplay right they right. got no they got no airplay they were not commercially accessible and then i see rock and roll all night and so i drove everyone in this ice cream place crazy because i ran the song about 12 <laughs> times in succession because i couldn't believe they had a kiss song stop it kid <laughs> <laughs> and I also bought a pack of Kiss cards from this shop. So they obviously someone there was either a Kiss fan or yeah. I don't know. But that was really interesting. But yes. And, you know, rock and roll all night, Alan. I don't know about you, but if I never heard that song again, I would be OK with it. I own probably 150 versions of that song. Right. In various formats. The last few times that I saw Kiss, that was my cue to leave. So I could get to the parking lot and get yeah. out, you know, right. without having to fight the traffic. Cause I, just, I do not need to hear them play that song again. Yeah. It's like Iron Maiden's run to the hills. 
I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I do still enjoy that song, though. <laughs> I do too. I do too. But I've I've seen them seven times live. They played it every time. I'm like, oh, all yeah. right, I'm good. Oh yeah. But rock and roll all night. I mean, come on. That's enough. Yeah. enough. It's a great. It's a great anthem. It yeah. really encapsulates what the band was all about. It's fun. I, I will say, Alan, I took my wife to see Kiss her first time. She's not a Kiss fan. Mm-hmm. She likes Paul Stanley. So she knows a little bit about the band, but we had tickets in the third row right up front face to face with them. And when rock and roll all night came on the last song, I'm like, uh, you want to go? And she's like, are you out of your mind? I love this song. (laughs) She loved it. She was like, are you crazy? So for people that are not such fans of the band, that is a, an endearing song. They really love it. So I was like, okay. So I still see the attraction. Yeah. And you know, there is something special about seeing a legendary song like that being played live by the people that created the song. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's just, there's some of those kind of songs that I never tire, you know, even though I would rather see a deep cuts show than a hits show, you know, and I really wish that kiss would get away from some of the same set lists that, well, not that they're going to from now on, cause they probably aren't going to play live again, but they just Are relied. They, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they're going to realize those avatars aren't going to fly the way they want them to, and they're going to hit the stage again. Oh, are we going to talk about that? Because I would love to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get there. Okay. At the end of the road. So speaking of the end of the road, you saw that tour twice, right? I did see that tour twice. What was your impression of it? Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Um, for me, it was more about nostalgia than it was about seeing uh, a great live band at the peak of their powers. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted my wife to see them. She had never seen them. I wanted her to see the spectacle of it all, and they delivered, right? When they yeah. come down on those saucers. Yeah. I mean, it's just so mind-blowing. The, yeah. the fire, the lights, you know, they deliver. On a performance level, they absolutely deliver. And, you know, she was just awed by the entire thing. I really enjoyed it. You know, when they did, um, they did War Machine. And it was during War Machine that all of this fire and flame is shooting out from under the drum risers. And you can feel it in the first few rows. And that was so powerful. So they still really do a great job. Were there some backing tracks? Absolutely. You, yeah. It was very clear um, that Gene was not singing at times, that Paul was not singing at times, which is ironic because they've been very critical of people who use backing tracks in the past. Yeah. And there was an interesting moment, Alan, where Paul Stanley came out and uh, for the opening to Heavens on Fire, which... I won't attempt to do it here, but you know, it's a really, <laughs> it's a really impressive vocal performance by right. young Paul Stanley. Well, he tried to do it live because, you know, it would have been very difficult to start on a track like that. Absolutely. And he croaked his way through this thing and it was ugly. Ooh. It was not good. Ooh. And so you, you really heard some of his limitations as a 70 year old man at that point. Right. Um, but I give him credit for attempting it, but it did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> was that the same on both shows or uh both shows wow both shows. yeah the yeah. track list did not change between the two shows that i saw yeah no i mean and they haven't changed track lists for decades i right. mean it's 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 you know and the only time that you really see anything different from them is on the kiss cruise where they right. do dip mm-hmm. into some of the deep tracks have you ever done one of the cruises no, you know, I've always wanted to, but my God, the, the cost, Alan, I know. good I know. Lord, you know, I'm an, I'm an educator. I can't spend that kind of money. It's just <laughs> difficult to justify that as much right. as I would love to. And you know how it kisses, they nickel and dime for everything. It's the cruise is one thing, but if you want to go to the unplugged show or the behind the scenes show, it, that's extra money. I mean, you could easily throw down $12,000 going to a kiss cruise. Right, right. Now, speaking of expense and special events. Um, what was it a year or so ago, there was a, a, an event that had an appearance by Ace, Bruce yeah. and Vinny and you Creatures were there. Fest. Creatures Fest. Yeah. Creatures. I wanted to go so badly. So to be clear, I, I did not go, I think, oh. and I'm not sure if court went or not. I did not go, but I was very invested in this and I have a few friends that went okay. and I was obviously very interested in particular to find out about Vinny Vincent. Yeah, Vinny Vincent, that that enigmatic character that is Vinny Vincent. I was just so curious to find out, and I've got some great behind the scenes stories. Uh, you know, kind of uh, 
third person narrative if you're inter interested in hearing any of this. Yeah. Well, so absolutely. So Creatures Fest, which took place in Nashville last year, one of the events that people were really excited about was a performance by Vinnie Vincent, Bruce Kulick, and Ace Fraley. They were going to be on the same stage, presumably playing Kiss hits. <laughs> and as you know, uh, Vinnie Vincent is a slippery character. He is uh, very difficult to corral. He always changes the, the terms in which he's willing to appear and perform. But they made this happen. Everyone was really excited. And I had a couple of buddies that were standing outside the door to this auditorium where the three of them were set to perform. They waited an additional hour past the time that it was supposed to start. People were getting a little restless. They were upset. And suddenly they can hear through the door someone is noodling on the guitar. And the doors open, and there is Vinnie Vincent alone on stage on top of a tank, yep. just doing what he's always done, but not as articulate nor fast as he once was. It was just a – he was – well, what's the term that Gene Simmons – he vomits notes. So, <laughs> yeah. so there's no composition. There's no form. He, he doesn't seem to have a sense of – you know, um, creating a template that he's going to play in or over. And so he's just, it's just a lot of little, 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 and whammy yeah. bar, whammy bar, whammy bar, this sort of thing. <laughs> but then a bewildered looking Bruce Kulick and Ace Fraley come out. And I found out later from listening to Bruce Kulick interviews that basically Vinny said he wasn't going to go out unless they let him go out first and start the show. So he could make this grand appearance and then they really hadn't rehearsed, and so it was very messy, but Bruce and Ace tried to do the best that they could in order yeah. to get through this thing, but it was really quite the disaster. The other story is afterwards, Vinny Vincent had a meet and greet where he would sign things. One of my buddies had this jacket, and on the back of the jacket, it had the images of the uh, original six players in makeup, so Eric Carr and Vinny, everyone that had worn makeup in the band. Yeah. And five of the six panels had been signed by band members. The only one that had not been signed was Vinnie Vincent's panel. Hmm. And so I guess the, the understanding was, is if you participated in this event and you paid the extra money to, for the meet and greet, that Vinnie would sign anything other than a guitar. Okay. So my buddy comes up, he puts the jacket down. So nice to meet you, Vinny, et cetera, et cetera. Vinny looks at the jacket and he goes, oh. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't sign that. That's that's I, I just that's going to be more money. And wow. my buddy was he was livid. He was upset. Yeah. And at one point, he actually looked at Vinnie Vincent's handler and he says, "Are you really going to allow this?" And he kind of gave him a hard time. And so Vinny begrudgingly signed the panel of this thing without getting any extra money. But he was trying to get an extra two or three hundred dollars out of out of this guy. Jeez, just unbelievable. And so all of the stories that we've heard about Vinnie Vincent over the years was just confirmed. Yeah. with this first person account, really incredible, but not at all surprising. Yeah. All right. So as we've mentioned, Kiss has had a 50 year career They're You just finished their final tour. Um, who knows if there will be any personal appearances, any live performances from this point on, but presumably no more tours. We know that they've done farewell tours before, you know, so who knows? But I think that they're at a point now where they really can't tour again, but you know, that's still 50 years of music. Yeah. So I want to kind of get into some of the highlights from each of those eras. So um, I'm interested to know from you favorite albums from the 70s. Before I answer that, Alan, do you think that a Las Vegas residency is possible for Kiss? Um, maybe. I, I, yeah, I, I, I do think that's a possibility. That's an interesting thing. I hadn't thought about that before, but yeah. And maybe it's something that they will integrate the avatars into. Who knows? You know, I don't know. But yeah, I think it's possible. So what do you think? Top one or two albums from the 70s. What's your highlights? Albums of the 70s. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of the debut. That's probably still my favorite Kiss album of all time. I am also really partial to Destroyer. Yeah. Uh, Destroyer is a personal favorite of mine. I know that people have mixed feelings about Destroyer. Um, I like Destroyer because they were trying to do something very different and creative. I, I don't mind the orchestral feel to certain songs on Destroyer. I think it adds to the mystique of the band. Paul and Gene have both said that they think that's probably their finest album because they were, they were stretching musically. 
Rock and Roll Over, Alan, and I'd love to get your input on this. I think Rock and Roll Over is probably the most underrated of the Kiss albums. I absolutely love that record. I think the songs are super fun. A lot of them are, um, well, they're about sex. A lot of the, the subject matter is, <laughs> is sexual, which is certainly their MO. Um, right. A lot of songs about, uh, you know, hooking up in hotels and promiscuity and, you know, love them and leave them, that sort of thing. But then you've got songs like Dr. Love. Calling Dr. Love is just so great. Um, I really enjoy that song. And my probably one of my all-time favorite Kiss songs is Mr. Speed. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Speed is a song that I've actually been trying to play recently. And I am convinced that neither Paul nor Ace wrote that song, that that was written by someone else. Because if you attempt to perform that song guitar, it, it bears no resemblance to any other Kiss song in terms of the guitar player's ability it is mm. really challenging that guitar player is doing something that really was not in ace and paul's wheelhouse at the time and they really never have produced any songs that uh, there's a lot of sliding and bar chords it's really a nifty little riff um mm -hmm. so I i'm convinced that they had outside writers and we know that they did often have outside writers but there's still this mystery about who actually wrote that song i will say i watched Kiss performed that song on the Kiss Cruise on a video, um, and they did a great job on it. So they, mm -hmm. it, it's clear that you know they did learn how to play the song, but I am convinced that they did not write it. Nevertheless, I think it's a great song. I like the contributions of Peter on on that as well. Baby Driver is just a fantastic Dude, song. I love that song. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so great. You know, I think that Pete gets a, a lot of flack, and as a drummer, you know people have different opinions about that but i think a lot of the songs that he contributes to the albums are great and yeah. baby driver might be my favorite of his songs i, uh, think I agree it's fantastic. with you i think it's the best thing he ever did it's just a it, it's a it is a great driving song baby driver right it's it's really it's got a you know really a pumping riff and the, the drums are great on it and court and i've had this conversation paul stanley probably had the best voice he was the best vocalist in the band mm -hmm. but peter in my view had the best rock and roll voice that yeah. raspy quality god he had a great voice yeah i agree with that um i agree with you i think rock and roll over is it's a standout for me i think that my best my favorite one from the 70s would be is love gun i mean i mean i know it was my first one but i also think it's the best musically i think it's the best written album um but man rock and roll over is so strong my 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 two picks were going to be love gun and alive but now that yeah. we're talking about rock and roll over <laughs> i just dig that album so much it's great i love love gun love gun's another one that i didn't own as a kid and so it, it kind of ranks a little lower in the pantheon of kiss albums but i i do like it it has a distinct kind of 50s feel like some of the songs kind of harken back to the influences of Paul and Gene in the 1950s in much the same way that songs on Unmasked do that, right? There's a, an attempt to kind of go back and create these very accessible kind of pop rock songs, almost like uh, power pop. And I love it. I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. So moving on, what's your picks from the eighties? Oh, this is really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go first with Lick It Up. Yeah. I, I love Lick It Up. When they took the makeup off, um, I wasn't so sure if that was going to work for them. What did I know? <laughs> That's one <laughs> of the top selling albums. It, it did very well for them, but I really love the guitar work on that album. Um, and of course, Benny Vincent is a major contributor on that album. Mm -hmm. uh, so he could get it done. He, he could deliver in terms of songwriting. Um, yeah, really yeah. great songs. I love the song uh, Not for the Innocent. I think that's a great Gene song. Mm -hmm. It's dark, it's brooding, it's it's heavy. So they had a they had an, an edge. They became really a nice, gritty, straightforward hard rock band again, as they had been with the first album. So for me, it was a return to roots. Uh, yeah. I like that. I think, um, oh, I'd have to go Creatures of the Night. I think that's probably next on the list. And Animalize are my top three. Um, okay. This might be a little controversial, but the Kulik albums of the 80s, I like them, but I'm not as big a fan of that era of the band as I am um, the mm -hmm. 70s and, and early 80s. Yeah. My my top one of of any Kiss album is Creatures. 
Yeah, I absolutely love it. But then, you know, I was, I was a, I was an Eric Carr fan from minute one and was really excited about the whole idea of changing personnel and adding new characters to the, there it is. That is a, that is a cover of beauty. I'm just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's such a good album and they were in a position where they are like having to prove themselves again. And I think that's one of the strengths of love gun also, because, you know, the, the creatures experiment did not work. It didn't sell. It didn't, that strange. it didn't, I know. And it's an amazing album. It it's didn't so really catch a new audience. So love gun, they are hungry again. They are you know, they are determined again. They don't have the track record that they can necessarily, you know, coast on any longer. And I, you think mean, lick that, it up. That, you, that you, said I said? Love gun. you said love gun. I think Dang you meant it. lick it up. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> lick it up is, is where they really get hungry again and having to prove themselves again and having to reestablish themselves. And man, it's yeah. such a, it is a killer album. I think and, you're right. Can and I, I ask you that, this, Alan? Yeah. On this album, Creatures of the Night, what's your favorite track? Or can you, you know, what are some highlights? Because I'm really well, curious. Okay. okay. One of them, anytime I think of a perfect opening song that is going to make me punch my fist in the air, it's Creatures. So that yeah. is definitely a highlight. Um, Rock and Roll Hell is, is a, a really good one that I think doesn't get that much attention. Killers is a great song. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's just a solid album top to bottom and of course war machine dude yeah come yeah. on now for me the best song on the album is saint and center that's a gr that was eric carr's favorite song to play i, I, I love that song it's great that is, how was that not a massive hit that song it's so accessible yeah it's got a kind of it's got a um um kind of a melodic pop quality to it but yet it's heavy gene's vocals are amazing i mean there's it's it's a perfect song i just cannot imagine how that did not become huge along with songs like thrills in the night off of animalize how did that not become massive these were those were such accessible songs in the 80s well at least thrills got released as a single yeah, Satan true. Center never did, and mm -hmm. and it still didn't become that much of a hit, and it should have because it is a solid song. Yeah, yeah, another one with a, nary a bad song on it. Totally, and for a third pick, you picked um, Animalize. I think I would go Asylum. I think Asylum is just a, it's a raw album. It's more like angry, I guess is a is a way to put it, and I love it. I mean, I think uh, I think Animalize is fantastic. I really love it. And, and, you know, Mark St. John, that's a, that's a sad story in the kiss history. But, yes, it is. But mm -hmm. Asylum, man, it's just, just killer. Yeah. And to be clear, I like the eighties albums and they've really yeah. grown on me over time, but it, they had gone in a different direction. They were trying to be Bon Jovi with those albums. Oh, they yeah. wanted, they were chasing hits and they were successful largely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They were pretty successful in molding themselves to the MTV generation. And without costume and makeup, that's hard to do, you know, because then they're just another band. And I think that they were really successful at that. Although if you look, Alan, it's not that they didn't have on makeup. They just changed well, the true. makeup. <laughs> Especially you know, you, in the asylum era. Oh my gosh. You know, Gene has even said himself that he looked like a 240 pound transvestite. Yes. <laughs> and that is the worst album cover ever. It really is. Yeah. And I think but, that turned a lot of people off, but I, I, musically, I think it's great. I agree. It is a good album. Now, another one that I really like is crazy nights. And I know a lot of people don't like that. I think musically it's great. I think the production is awful. I've heard that as and, well. Ron Nevison himself has said he went the wrong direction with that album and wishes he had done something different. So I can understand people not really taking to that one. Okay. So nineties and beyond. I don't well, know that there's enough in the two thousands. Yeah, right. <laughs> this, this is pretty easy. Yeah. 
So, uh, you know, let's see, 19, well, so Revenge is the big one, right? <sighs> Revenge, I think, was like a return to form. It's interesting how they've gone back from time to time and tried to recapture that spark of what made them great and what, yeah. you know, really enticed fans to love them to begin with. And I think Revenge is a great example of that. There's some great songs on that album. Uh, that's been in pretty heavy rotation for me lately. Um, really like that album. And that's another one that I was a late comer, right? I, I, I mm -hmm. like so many early Kiss fans, I bailed on the band after probably Animalize. And I was not a fan in the 80s of those albums, but I returned to the band in the 90s with Revenge, particularly yeah. with Unplugged. And then, of course, the reunion tour. I actually really like the Unplugged album. I think it's great. <laughs> well, when I was putting my list together of my like two best albums from 90s and beyond, it's Revenge and Unplugged. Oh, wow. I think Unplugged is phenomenal. Yeah, it's really a lot of fun. As far as live albums go, it might be their most honest live album. You know, yeah, there's not a like overdubs or anything like that on it. And mm -hmm. and musically speaking, it is really good. The playing on that album is fantastic. Oh the singing is great. A couple of things I'll just point out about Unplugged. That version of Going Blind is so incredible. That it, that's always been a great song. But the way they capture the essence of that song, that acousticized yeah. performance is really great. Yeah. Um, and then Sure Know Something. Oh, if you fantastic. listen to Bruce Kulick's solo towards the end of that, you yeah. know, and that's not even on the original album. He just yeah. created that for the acousticized version. Man, yeah. is it good. Just a great <laughs> album. And that's really what brought me back to Kiss in the 90s. And then, of course, the reunion tours. And I, and I was like a little bit more nostalgia. You know, it's not like new material. It's going back into the, the Kiss classics. But I remember the first time I listened to that album, I was I went to the record store and I saw it and I was like, oh, I've got to have that. I put it on and I didn't look at the track list. I wanted to be surprised. I wanted to be like it was an actual concert that I was attending and just have the music unfold as it as it naturally would. And I was just blown away by the song selection, by the some of the deep cuts that they went to i mean they played an elder track yeah holy World heroes. smokes yeah, oh did, my god man i mean who would ever think and you know if you watch the if you watch the video from it which is unedited paul is like okay here's a song this is from an album that people either love it or they hate it and you can hear people in the audience like they're just kind of cheering elder elder and he goes yeah. This is from The Elder, and, and the place went nuts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> purists. The purists love that album. Exactly. And it's a really great version of that album, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, of, of that song. Yes. Yes. Um, Any love for anything beyond the 90s? Monster you know, or... I I actually really enjoy Carnival of Carnival of Souls, so still That's talking a fantastic 90s here. record. Man, I think it's one of their best albums. I always put it in the top five. I love it because it's so different from anything else that they did. It's yeah. it's clearly Bruce Kulick that's the driving force behind yeah. that album. You can just hear it in the playing. They're trying to really stretch musically. I know they were trying to have a hit. They were trying to basically emulate what Smashing Pumpkins and Stone Temple Pilots and whatnot were doing. Yeah. I really think it works, though. I like that album. I, I, it's one of the ones I go back to the most. Yeah. Um, and I think it's their, one of their most underrated albums. It's really a shame that it was supposed to have shipped platinum and then they shelved it. Yeah. We actually had a chance on our podcast to talk to Toby Wright, the producer, and he was just astonished that they shelved it because it was supposed to ship platinum. It, it, all, it was all systems go. And then Paul made the decision to do the reunion tour and just backburnered it. And yeah. Toby Wright was really disappointed in that because he felt that they had gold. And I think they did. I agree with it. I mean, you know, the whole that whole era was them trying to chase whatever style was in fashion at that time Very and much. grunge was was happening and i think that they turned in a really good record with that one the jungle man oh, that is one of the awesome. best songs from that era by any band yes yeah it's fantastic oh. and it's such a dark album which is yeah you know i know they say well kiss has got some darker albums nothing like this nothing. I mean, this is on another level the subject matter the downtune guitars i mean it is a heavy album i love it yeah it's fantastic 
Um, but so like into the 2000s, Sonic Boom and Monster, any love for uh, that? I don't like either of those albums. I yeah. feel like they were just phoning it in. I know Paul has said in his autobiography that he thinks Monster is one of the best albums they've ever done. Hmm. I'm not sure what he was, um, you know, I, I, maybe that's just a way to sell albums. I'm not sure. But um, the one that I actually really like is um, Psycho Circus. Psycho Circus is an album that I go back to pretty often. And I know that one is also controversial because it is a patchwork yeah. of different different musicians. Peter, I don't know that he plays on it at all. I think he does a couple vocals. Ace mm -hmm. Frehley only plays on the one song that he um, wrote, which is maybe the best song on the album. It's the, really one of the better straightforward rock tracks on the album. Oh, yeah. Along, along with Gene's song, Within, which is a, a holdover from the Kulik years. Mm -hmm. um, but Within, I think that's just one of Gene's heaviest. Uh, it's really a, a dark kind of brooding song. So I think there's some bright spots on that album. It's uneven, but I do like it. Yeah. Didn't, didn't Peter play on Ace's song? Uh, he may have. Yeah, he may have. I know that there's a lot of questions as to who played on what. Know. We know that they, we know they, they offer some vocal performances. You know, I'm at the point now where when Ace is playing on something, I can usually tell that it's Ace, oh, not yeah. the same for the drums. Like it's hard for me to distinguish between one drummer and another, unless you're going from like Peter Chris to Eric Carr that I can tell. Yes. Yeah. But I think they were trying to create cohesion. And so they were asking Phil mm -hmm. and drummers to play like Peter Chris. Yeah. Into the Void, though, sounds like Peter to me. It sounds like his style and it's less precise than the sense. other tracks. Makes you know, sense. the studio musicians are like clockwork and there's a there's a little bit of flexibility in uh, Into the Void, which fits yeah. Ace's songs, of course, you know, because that, Ace that is tracks. that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but, you know, back to the 2000s, I, I think that Sonic Boom is an OK album. It's it's not bad. I think it's Modern Day song. Delilah is a great song. Oh yeah, that's the best. I that's love the standout. That yes. When I first heard the the track before the album came out, I was like, "Holy moly! They actually made a new Kiss classic. This is going to be an amazing album." The album was okay. But yeah, that's definitely the highlight of the album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Psycho Circus, the the album track, the title track, that was in their live show forever. So. You know, they managed to oh, play yeah. some of the some some of the music from that. I actually think Psycho Circus is a pretty cool song. Yeah. On the last album they did, which is Monster, we were talking earlier about Peter Chris's vocals and how he's a great rock singer. There's a track uh way down toward the end of Monster that they gave to Eric Singer to sing, and it's called All for the Love of Rock and Roll, and it is so good. Yeah. If I were in a tribute band, I would throw that song in. And it sounds like a Peter Chris song. It sounds like one that they had written with Peter in mind. And I can totally hear Peter's raspy mm -hmm. rock and roll voice on that song. And it just sounds like it came from the 70s. Yeah. Didn't they give both Bruce and Eric a vocal track on on the Monsters? I think they both have a song, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that. But I, I want to say that Eric also did a vocal. Did he not? Uh, sorry, Tommy. 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 Or yeah, Tommy about. has, Tommy's got Out of This World, which, of course, he's That's trying it. to, you know, play into the Spaceman theme. He you is. Know? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. But, now, I, you know, it's okay. I, I think it's got a couple of standouts. Um, oh, what was the, the track that got a little bit of traction off of Monster? There was one. The, what was the single? Oh, um... Uh, Hell and Hallelujah. That's the one. Hell and Hallelujah. It was okay. I thought yeah. that song was all right. Now, the, the Tommy song on Sonic Boom, When Lightning Strikes, I thought that was really good. Yeah. I like yeah. that one a lot. I think Sonic Boom is, is probably a stronger album than Monster. Yeah. Altogether. Yeah. Monster sounded very formulaic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our last couple of minutes, let's just talk about the future of Kiss. Because we just finished the, the the last tour, which went on for like 35 years, it seems like. <laughs> and they ended with this announcement of the new era of KISS, which is the, everybody I think is familiar with the ABBA show that they put together, which was controversial in itself with the, the big digital avatars, which people, I don't know if this is the official name, but people have dubbed them the ABBA-tars. And now KISS is going this route with big KISS avatars that they unveiled at the final show on the last tour. What do you think? 
I think it's silly. I really do. <laughs> I just think it's nonsense. At this point, just get you know get Paul and Gene's sons to to don the makeup and go out there and perform. And if they need to lip sync, let them lip sync. You know anything? There's so many great tribute bands out there. Mr. Speed is a great tribute band. Dress yeah. to Kill is a great tribute. There are other bands that are performing these songs live. Just find some people that look a lot like and sound a lot like Paul and Gene and and trot them out there. If you if you want to if you want to carry on in that way, I just right. I, I cannot imagine spending any amount of money to go see avatars perform live. I don't know what they're thinking with this, but they had said for many years that the band was going to carry on in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. I had envisioned something like Rockstar Supernova many yes, years ago. That's they exactly had this, what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, like this competition where they find, you know, they they have rehearsals and auditions and they figure out who the best performers are mm -hmm. and or and that would can you imagine the traction that would get on television a gene and paul and maybe they bring back some of the former members yeah. to to act as a panel of judges yeah i mean that would be some highly anticipated television people would yeah. watch that so i don't quite know what they're thinking with the avatars we'll see where it goes i can't imagine it's going to be very lucrative but like with rockstar supernova yes it'll get traction on television will it go any farther than that will anybody right. be interested in seeing them in a concert hall uh, depends on the quality of the product I, yeah. you know i love kiss if the, i knew that this new incarnation of kiss was coming through town and they were going to play a bunch of deep cuts that i'd yeah. never heard yeah. i might go I don't know that deep cuts are the brand though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kiss well, is so brand oriented, mm -hmm. you know, that they will stick to that, you know, track list that comes from alive and destroyer and a few eighties hits and same thing as always. Yeah. They could sprinkle those in. I, I feel like, you know, any new incarnation of kiss would be primarily hardcore fans and purists that are going to see the band who really love what the yeah. band is about. So they could do Strutter and Firehouse and those, but also sprinkle sure. in, you know, some deep cuts, things that we want to hear off of Elder and uh, Carnival of Souls. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That could be a lot of fun. I wonder what's going to happen with the cruises from here on. Are Kiss going to still perform at the cruises? That's Will they continue question. the cruises? Yeah. Well, you know that they're going to because there's I mean, so much money. money to be made, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they can limit their performances and what they do. Sure. So, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if that carries on for a few more years, although I've not heard anything officially. So uh, what about a touring exhibition? You know, you, like a, like mean? a, like a big museum that just travels from city oh, to city. Do you oh, think, I mean, cool. that would be amazing. And I yeah. think that that would be a way that they wouldn't feel like fans wouldn't feel like they're being, you know, built or whatever with, you know, big cartoon animated things. And people would spend money to go see that stuff. Well, you know, they did the kiss conventions in they the nineties. And, you know, as I understand it, listening to Paul's autobiography, it wasn't particularly lucrative. They didn't make a lot of money mm. doing it. But that was then and this is now. You could probably right. charge $500 a ticket <laughs> to people, right. right? And then if you want to do some of the extracurricular things, meet and greets and whatnot, well, mm -hmm. they can charge for that too. There's probably money to be made there where they don't actually perform but rather do Q&A and yeah. interaction and that sort of thing. And yeah. you know how they are. I mean, it, there's no one that enjoys making money more than Gene and Paul and Gene. Boy, ain't that the truth. You know, they could, can you imagine if they were selling the battle axe bases, right? And he was yeah. going to sign it for you. If I, I don't, I, I don't have that kind of money, but if I did, I probably would buy one <laughs> if I got to meet Gene and get him to sign it. Yes, absolutely. Well, all right. That is going to do it for us, Matt. Thank you so much for joining me and talking about one of my favorite topics. Always a pleasure. Alan, <laughs> thanks so much for having me. I love talking kiss. So tell listeners a little bit more about the podcast. The Rock and Metal Profs podcast is uh, currently, I guess we'll say it's on hiatus. Uh, we haven't done any new episodes, but there are about 70 episodes that are available for stream and download. You can find them on any of your popular streaming platforms. Um, you might want to go out and listen to this sooner rather than later. Alan, I don't know if I've told you this or not, but we're planning on ending the podcast um, officially in April. Uh, oh. We did we did about three years of it. That was yeah. always the goal was to do about three years. And we had a heck of a lot of fun doing it. But yeah. uh, 
we still have a huge listening base. We're really amazed at how many people continue to download and listen. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll probably pull the episodes here sooner rather than later. There's talk of maybe putting them up on YouTube so that they're accessible forever and for free. So we'll, we'll probably migrate them to YouTube so people can still listen. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's a quality show and I absolutely love it. And people should definitely go check it out. Thank you, brother. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. And we're recording this on Super Bowl Sunday. So I know you're anxious to, to get off this and, and to, you know, get ready for friends coming over and get ready for the big game. What's your prediction? Well, being a lifelong 49ers fan, I'm going to say <laughs> 49ers by seven, although I'm also a realist and I know that Kansas City is very good. So we'll see how it goes. I'm just going to do my best to keep my cool while there are guests in my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, have a fantastic day. I hope the game goes your way. Thanks. Man. And I'll talk to you soon, man. All right, man. Take it easy. Take care, buddy. Pardon the interruption. We'll bring you back to your podcast in just a moment. But first, promo for the Cosmic Pizza Podcast. In the Cosmic Pizza Podcast, your pizza delivery guys, Dan, Sean, and Paul, serve you a slice of life. As we discuss literally anything in the universe. Conspiracy theories. Movies that we've liked. Women in comedy, voice actors, film directors and producers, authors. But what we don't talk about is pizzas. Wednesday, I'm here with you people. It's wild. All right, we are back. Thanks once again to Matt Alschbach of the Rock and Metal Profs podcast for joining me for this great discussion about KISS. I hope you enjoyed that. Join us again next week when Stephanie and Rob will be back. Thank goodness, because I have missed them. And we will be talking about the music of 1974. And that was a great year. And we've got a lot of really good stuff lined up. I'd love to hear some of your comments about Kiss. If you're a Kiss fan, when you got into Kiss, favorite albums, whatever you want to say. So just drop us an email at modernmusicology1 at gmail.com. Or just look for our social posts and just make a comment there and I'll find it. So thanks once again. Join us next week for 1974. Keep rocking on and have a great week. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the T Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.